entire arm it has more black than white. I think I like number one question. I'm going to go through it. Maybe Yes. Does 
everyone understand what he just said? I mean, look at these numbers mod 13. Any two numbers which have the same value mod 13, their difference is a multiple of 13. Well, mod 13 can only take 13 different values from 0 up to 12. There are 14 numbers, 14 pigeons, 13 holes. So there has to be at least one value mod 13 that two of these numbers take. 3D. Um, here's another one of my favorites. two subsets of this list of numbers, two different subsets of this list of numbers, that have the same total. There are ten numbers. All of them are less than a thousand. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, darn it. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> the nine oh, yeah, to do the ten. Sorry. There are ten numbers here, all of which are less than a hundred. I I'm very sorry. I've had too much coffee. Oh. <laughs> ten numbers, all of which are less than a hundred. I claim that there are two subsets with the same total. Prove this claim. What are the pigeons and what are the holes? Pigeons is the power, power set. Yeah, so how many pigeons are there? 2 to the 10. Which is? Uh, 5 hundred. Oh, it's 1,024. It's 1,024, yeah. What are the holes? 1K. 102. Well, I mean, what defines a hole? Where are the pigeons trying to fit? No, no, but I mean, what kind of thing is a hole? The sum, the possible sum. It's a sum, a sum of the numbers. Possible sum. Well, there are ten numbers, and all of them are less than a hundred, so... Zero. Less than one sum. So, uh, so a sum is somewhere in the range zero up to a thousand at most, because I have ten numbers, all of which are less yeah. than or equal to a hundred. So there are this many holes, this many pigeons, so therefore two of the pigeons have to fit in the same hole. There are just more subsets than there are different possible sums. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there must be two subsets with the same total sum. One of the charming things about this problem, though, is that no one knows an efficient method for actually finding the subset. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to prove, I mean, this pair of subsets. So it's very easy to prove that a pair of subsets exists but no one knows an algorithm which takes less than exponential time as a function of the size of the list, which I actually find. But anyway, this pigeonhole principle is kind of neat. I mean, not, not every problem at first is obviously a pigeonhole principle, but, you know, uh, sometimes you can phrase it that way. <coughs> All right, so today I want to briefly discuss uh, a more powerful class of languages than um, finite state automata. And these are called context-free languages. <coughs> and um, they, they correspond to a little type of machine which is a little bit more powerful than a finite state machine. So first, let me, um, let me give a definition of these in terms of a grammar. Okay? And indeed, context-free languages were first invented by formal linguists, um, people surrounding Noam Chomsky at MIT, 
in the 1950s. And although they're not very good models of human language, they're pretty good models of computer languages. Although which way is the cause and which is the effect, I'm not sure. But you'll see what I mean in a moment. So let me give an example of a grammar. There's always an initial symbol, which I'll call S. So first of all, what's the linguistic idea? The linguistic idea is that when you decide you wish to say something, you start with an abstract symbol in your brain called S for sentence. And you then start applying these things called production rules. Each production rule expands one of the symbols in your brain into several symbols. Um, so for instance, one type of sentence, um, at least in English, is noun, verb, noun. Like something did something to something else. Okay. Um, by the way, if you look at, so if you, you know, we have subjects, objects, and verbs. It turns out that of the six possible orderings you could have, one of the six, I think, doesn't occur in any human language, but the other five do. But I can't remember which it is. It's like, mm, I mean, some languages, right, use order a lot, like English. Other languages inflect verbs by adding suffixes and more rarely prefixes that tell you whether that, that, uh, that noun is uh, the subject or object, like the Romance languages, for instance. And in that case, you can play a lot more with the order because you've tagged them um, with these tags. Uh, but anyway, I, I forget. One of these hardly ever happens, maybe uh, object, verb, subject, or something like that. Anyway. Um, okay, but maybe nouns can also produce more complicated things. So for instance, in English, adjectives come before nouns. So you could do something like that. And then at some point, these things have to turn into actual words. So um, let's say it's, uh, you know, this turns into Jack, this turned into fetched, this turned into fresh, and this turned into water, all right? So the idea is that when you emit a sentence, something like this happens in your brain. I'm fairly sure that nothing like this happens in my brain. I think in my brain, just a confused jumble of things sort of bubble to the top. They know some rules about, you know, this shouldn't come first uh, unless that thing has been said already. So they sort of shuffle themselves into order, and then I blurt it out, usually with a couple of mistakes. So I mean, I really don't think that uh, our, our internal mental machinery is anything as clean and simple as this. But as far as mathematical models go, maybe it's a place to start. And then the idea is that when you hear this sentence, you parse it. And what it means to parse a sentence is to build this tree as you heard the sentence left to right. And so you hear Jack, and then you sort of think, well, maybe there's a verb coming up soon. And you hear fetched. And you know that fetched is a transitive verb, so it wants to have an object. And then you're sort of waiting to hear an object. And then you hear this adjective fresh. And you're like, oh, that's right. Adjectives come first in English. All right, well, I'll wait around to see what uh, fresh what. And then finally, you get water. I always thought it was strange that in English, you would say, watch out. There's a big, hairy, green, ravenous, ah. So, you know, maybe for some purposes it would make more sense to have the adjectives come after. But anyway, so a context free language. So, language is again a set of strings. And now we're getting more into why linguistics called these sets languages. The idea is that some sets of strings are grammatical and others are sheer nonsense. And there's a big debate, by the way, about semantics versus syntactics. So, some linguists came up with the sentence, the colorless green ideas sleep furiously. 
which is supposed to be an example of a grammatical but meaningless sentence. So it's supposedly syntactic but not semantic. And then people argue that meaning is just kind of fancier grammar and that there isn't really any distinction between grammatical structure and meaning. And anyway, so these debates go on. Um, all right. Now, what is context-free about this language? Why do we call it context-free? The idea is that each of these rules, like changing noun to adjective noun or changing this adjective finally to the word fresh, doesn't depend on any of its neighbors in the string. It doesn't depend on any of these symbols' context. Okay? So you can do things to these symbols independently of what is next to them. Whereas a context-sensitive grammar would be one where certain production rules are only allowed if that, if that symbol has something else next to it. Okay? So, um, getting away from uh, human language, let me give you an example of uh, a context-free language which is not regular. Maybe you can already imagine one. So first, let me write down the rest of the definition. So, there are usually not one, but two alphabets. <coughs> there is what are called the variables. These are sort of the internal symbols that can change into other ones. We'll call these V. And for instance, the initial symbol is a member of that alphabet. Then there are the so-called terminals, which are the actual things that you will say or print out or whatever it is you're doing. So these don't produce any more, uh, they don't, they don't change into other things. They're part of the final product. And then we have a set of production rules. And you can have any finite number that you want. And uh, each production rule takes a single variable, v, and changes it into a word which can consist of variables and terminals which we know we can write like that. And then finally, the language generated by this grammar is the set of strings. So if this whole thing is called G, the language generated by G is the set of strings made up just of terminals, <coughs> but which can be derived from S using these production rules in that set. So for example, here's a nice little one. So remember last time we showed using the pumping lemma that this language, oops, that's not what I mean at all, sorry. That this language consisting of a block of A's followed by an equal block of B's is not regular. But it's very easy to generate this using a context-free grammar. So if here's my initial, uh, my initial symbol, what should I be allowed to change it into? ASB. ASB. So what it can do is it can pump out an A and a B on either side. So my, my terminals here will be the symbols A and B. Actually, my variable will just be S. So what happens? I start with S. I change it into ASB. I change S again into ASB. So now I have AASBB. I mean, notice it sort of just expands that part of the word. Other things stay the same. You could draw a little tree showing how these things are descended. So you do this as many times as you want. And I need to add another rule at the end to clean things up. What other rule should I add? Empty symbols. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, there are a couple things I could do. If I want n to be able to be zero, I should. I mean, I could change s to a b, but then there, oh, I would always have to have at least one pair. So I'll allow s to also turn into the empty word. So this is just a shorthand for two different rules. S can go to a s b, or s can go to the empty word. All right. Well, how about a more interesting example? Does, that, does everybody understand that in this in this sense if so t equals s just s I'm sorry v equals that t the set of terminals is a and b and then here's my grammar and then this is the language generated by that grammar is that clear 
Um, notice that there's sort of a difference in philosophy here, um, which will turn out not to be so different. But notice that um, our, our finite state automata, someone else gives you a word, and you read it from left to right, and you have to say whether it's okay or not. So it's like recognizing and saying yes or no to the input. Here, it's a slight difference in attitude. Here, we're generating these things. Okay. And actually, at the moment, if I give you a complicated grammar, it's not obvious how hard or how easy it is to look at a string and tell if it can be generated. Right? I mean, there are many different ways that the tree of productions could branch. And how are you going to figure out whether there is a tree, or as linguists say, a derivation, which leads to a string that I give you? The problem might be hard, it might be easy. But at the moment, we're looking at generating words rather than recognizing them. <coughs> Um, so, uh, however, this is not so different because going back to our finite state automata, like this one for the no two Bs in a row, well, turn around and think of this as a generator rather than a recognizer. So rather than reading at a word of A's and B's and having it do transitions, let it choose and write down a string of symbols for any legal path that it can take. Now it's generating the word instead of recognizing it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I mean, it can choose to go this way, and uh, oops, this is wrong, sorry. It can choose to do this, and then that, and then this, and then this again, and so on. So the same setup of automata we could be using to generate words instead of, instead of either accepting or rejecting them. All right, let's look at a more interesting grammar. <coughs> so what is, and please, somebody who didn't know this before, what is the set of, of words so these parentheses here are actual symbols. So my terminals are consists of the left parenthesis and the right parenthesis. <coughs> okay. And my my set of variables is again just s. So tell me what set of words consisting of left and right parentheses this grammar can generate. Bunch of paired presidents can be, you know, kind of. You can be. The number of things. Hi the hierarchy of them, number. but they have to be paired. Legal pairs. Yeah, they have to be paired. So yeah. you said the number of left and right has to be equal. That's true, but it's not enough because I can't produce this. Oh, no. Yeah. 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 Okay. Just the same. Yeah, it's the same that the Unix command line yells at you sometimes if you haven't done it right. So, right? I mean, it's just it's if if I took an arithmetic formula and removed everything but the parentheses. That's it. Okay, yeah. it's what your compiler would yell at you if you didn't do. So things like this are okay, and you know, things like this are not. Right, so the point is that everyone has to have a pair, and you can see when it when it was born. They were born at the same time. Okay. Um, and you can kind of see also, uh, or or you say kind of whenever the right presidents came out, the reason, or at any point of this sequence, there's more. <laughs> left parents than the right ones? No, that's true. So one way to define a string of of, uh, of parentheses which is properly matched is that if you start here and read from left to right, that at, that at all points there are at least as many left parentheses as there are right parentheses. Okay. That's one way to define properly matched. Um, okay. Uh, 
There's one downside to this grammar, though, which is that um, let's, uh, let's take a smaller example like this word. So, um, you know, if you're going to listen to someone speak a sentence, or in computer science, if you're a compiler and you are reading some source code, you need to parse the tree, right? I mean, in a, I mean, what's why do I bring this up, right? I mean, take your favorite language with curly brackets in it, right? And so, you know, each of these left curly brackets is starting some block of code, and you need to know where the matching right curly bracket is in order to compile the code. Otherwise, you have no idea what's going on. I mean, when you you need to figure this out so you know what lines are being run by each loop and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, so it would be nice then if the derivation were unique. But here, when I do this first step, so I claim that this pair of parentheses could be this pair, or it could be this pair. After all, I could first make this pair. This S can just go away. This S will turn into that. This S will turn into that. Or I could have made this pair. Um, this S goes away. Uh, this S produces this pair along with an S inside it, which, pro which produces this pair. Okay. So this is what's called an ambiguous grammar. And the, you know the, the 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 danger with this is that you know in the linguistic analogy, if I say this, you're not sure what I mean. Okay, you're not sure how you know which noun is the object of which verb and so on. So there's a, a classic example of this in English, although it's not a commonly uttered sentence, which is that well, if I say police, police, police. You know what I mean, right? There's an internal affairs department, and it watches over the other police. Fair enough. But if I say police, 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 well, do I mean that the police police the police that the police police, or do I mean that the police who police police do, in fact, police police? <laughs> so in other words, which way do you parenthesize this? Um, well, OK. Let's try to make the grammar less ambiguous. So have I just, by, by changing this production rule, have I reduced the set of words that I can produce? No, but you reduced the ambiguity. Right. I can still produce, I claim I can still produce any properly matched string of parentheses. But you now know that the first thing you produce is the leftmost. Okay. So this is kind of nice. So what I'm saying is, you know, the language is just the set of strings. Okay. This particular language has more than one grammar which produces it. One of the so ambiguity is a function of a grammar. Okay, so it's a property of the grammar, not necessarily of the language. So this this language has an ambiguous grammar that generates it, but it also has an unambiguous grammar that generates it. Now, I'm not going to prove this, because I think it's getting too much into the details of context-free languages, which is ultimately not one of the chief topics of our course. But I found it delightful when I first learned it which is that there are some language, some context-free languages which are inherently ambiguous, which means that every grammar that generates them is ambiguous. I think that's kind of interesting. And what it says is that within the context-free languages, there's actually a subclass 
the, the unambiguous languages by which I mean those for which some unambiguous grammar exists. Okay, still with me? All right, so um, just, to, just to put these in context of what we've seen already, um, I claim that the regular languages are a subset of the context-free languages, or CFLs for short. <coughs> Um, can you prove this to me? Can you show me that any regular language is also context-free? That it can be generated by a context-free grammar? For instance, can you give me a context-free grammar that generates the strings of A's and B's with no two B's in a row? Anybody? The terminals will certainly be A and B. <laughs> That's a start. That's a good start. What about the variables? <laughs> well, look, I mean, the parenthesis language grew by kind of branching and being able to branch anywhere. Yeah. Within any pair of parentheses, it can have a bud on the tree, which is another pair of parentheses. Um, the A to the N, B to the N language was also a tree, but a much simpler one. It just had a central stalk with things being emitted off both sides. Well, you know, what about a, what about a regular language? What about just no two Bs in a row? Do I need all this branching going on? I don't, I can make it empty. The verb, uh. Can you make what empty? No. Well, I mean, we always have our initial symbol. You don't have to print, you just okay. kind of repeat. Then you just section. Well, S can certainly go to either A or a single B. That's certainly true. We are allowed to have more variables. I mean, think about think about this little finite state machine I drew before. There should be three variables. Where it looks like this, and think about it generating things. And each time it generates a B, the next thing it generates has to be an A. Yeah. So think about it crawling along and leaving a trail. Okay, if we have trees in our forest, maybe this is one of the snails on the forest floor. Okay, so yeah. it's leaving stuff behind. Every time you kind of yeah. got a tail of A. But how should we represent its current state? It has, our little snail can be in two different states. How should we represent that? As a variables, I'm sure it have two variables. Yeah, so let's call the variables. Give me names for the two variables. Two more about variables. V1 and V2. Okay. V1 and V2. <laughs> and these will represent the snail currently in being in this state or in that state. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I suppose <coughs> I suppose we could, if we like, make V1 the initial state. This V1 is kind of the state that you haven't produced a B yet, at least not immediately before. And that's certainly true at the start. All right, so what are the rules? What can V1 turn into? It can turn into AV1. It can turn into AV1 or? BV2. BV2. So it can leave an A or a B behind, but if it leaves a B, it has to switch to the other state. And V1 can turn into? AV1. 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 And then finally, when the snail has left enough of a trail, what, what is it allowed to do? Like V1 to epsilon. V1 is epsilon. 
Yeah, it, it's allowed to expire happily. <coughs> okay. So there you go. And I claim that you can do the same thing for any DFA, right? I mean, just have one variable for each state and for each transition that's allowed, have a production rule where it can leave behind that thing and change states. And then which states should be allowed to disappear? The planned state. Accepting state. The accepting, yeah, the, only the accepting states. So we, what, what we're having. Right, so in other words, if, if you're in, if you're in an, uh, a non-accepting state, you're not allowed to stop producing. Yeah. And if, which means, by the way, that if, if there were a doomed state like this, where V2 could go to B, V, B3. Well, I don't care what you allow V3 to do, but I'm never going to let it disappear, which means that it can never turn into a string just of the terminals A and B, which means it might as well not be there. Okay. So I, I think the easiest way to think of this is sort of like an NFA, where the illegal transitions are simply not shown rather than having a, a, a special reject state that they go into. Okay. So regular languages are context-free, but A to the N, B to the N is context-free, but we showed last time it's not regular. So this class is bigger than that class. So again, I mean, okay, so, so one reason to know about context-free languages is they show up in grammars. I, I mean, they show up in compilers, although they're not strictly context-free. Um, so as, as this field of linguistics developed, both on the human linguistic side and the programming language side, people realized that um, you, know, you need to introduce some long-range dependencies. Okay? Um, you know, for instance, uh, lots of languages, the, the person or the gender, or whether it's singular or plural, of the verb has to match the noun, and the noun might be very far away, and so it's handy to do to introduce some long-range dependencies. Similarly, in a uh, programming language, in, in many programming languages, you have to make sure that the variable types are okay. But these are sort of bells and whistles on top of what is essentially a context-free grammar, right? So I claim that you could actually write down almost a context-free grammar for a compilable program in C or Pascal or a, a language of that sort, and certainly in Lisp or Scheme, um, if you if you have taken those. I mean, basically, what's a legal program? Well, it can be empty, or it can have a block of code with you know some curly brackets. What can happen inside those curly brackets? Well, you can have a for statement and then some curly brackets, or you can have a while and then some curly brackets, and I know you functions too, blah, blah, blah. So the functions create some of these long-range dependencies. But roughly speaking, between any pair of curly brackets, you can make more curly brackets. And why are the curly brackets there? Well, they're, they're there so humans can read and write these programs, but also so the compilers can read them, mainly from top to bottom, although I'm sure modern-day compilers do a lot of other clever things. Um, and correctly parse the program and turn it into machine code. So I'm not going to talk about parsing algorithms. Um, one interesting fact about context-free languages is that um, the property of being efficiently parsable when read from left to right is a special property. And sometimes you allow yourself to look ahead a few symbols to help you do that. And if you look at serious books on compilers or books uh, like Aho and Ullman, um, you'll see things like LRK grammars, and these are grammars which can be efficiently parsed reading the word from left to right while letting yourself look ahead maybe k symbols, but otherwise you're only reading from left to right. So I, I'm not going to go too much into the details of that. For, for our purposes in, in this course, what I want you to think about is that this is a complexity class. I mean, think of, again, think of a language as a problem. The problem of telling whether something is in the language or not, although here I know we're, 
we're really more generating them than accepting or rejecting them. So this is a set or a problem, so is this. And we can really prove this one is bigger than this one. Okay? In this case, using some simple properties of these, namely the, that thing about having a finite number of equivalence classes and their equivalence relation, or the pumping lemma. Okay? So this is a very a small and simple enough complexity class that everything it can do, every problem it can solve has certain simple properties. And you can prove that another complexity class is bigger by giving an example which violates one of those properties. Is that at a broad scale what we're doing? So, I mean, inside here there are various subclasses, including the unambiguous ones, the LRK ones, and so on. Um, what I want to do next, though, so now we've seen a kind of generative description of both regular and context-free languages, a, a grammar description of them. But for, but for regular languages, we also had a machine which accepted or rejected, namely a finite state machine. So what kind of machine can accept or reject context-free languages? Does anybody know this who didn't know it 20 minutes ago? Or did you all already know it? So we have two groups of people, those who already knew it and those who still don't. Is that right? Well, okay, let me give you one more example and then, and then you'll figure it out. So remember another non-regular language we discussed was palindromes, okay? So there's no way for a poor little finite state automaton to tell whether the second half of a word is the mirror image of the first half because it would have to remember the entire first half to do that. Um, so let's say we have palindromes in of A's and B's, give me a grammar that generates palindromes. Things that are the same backwards as forwards. Things that are symmetric. ASA, 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 BSB, and I guess we're allowed to have a single A or a single B in the center, yeah. so it could turn into just A or just B, or, or the empty word. word. So this is a lot like the A to the N, B to the N language. There's still just a single <coughs> spine that things branch off of, but now I can branch an A on both sides or a B on both sides, and I'll generate, you know, one side will be the mirror image of the other. Okay. All right. Now, tell me how you would write a simple program that would read a string from left to right and tell that it's a palindrome. But I'm going to help you out. And I give you, I'm going to give you a program a little marker that tells it where the middle is. So instead of palindromes, let's look at palindromes of odd length whose central symbol is C, but everything, that's the only C. So it's A's and B's, a C, and then the same A's and B's in reverse order. So the grammar now is just this. All right? So um, I'm going to send you a series of A's, B's, and C's. Your job at the end of the day, you know, I'll press return at the very end. How do you tell it's a palindrome? And yes, I know, you could start at two ends and work your way in. But instead, I'm going to demand that you only read it, only read the string from left to right. Okay? So in a sense, I'm not going to give you the string all at once. I'm not going to let you hold the string all at once in your memory. Okay? Instead, I'm just, if you like, I'll send you one symbol each day. And, uh, well, I don't know. You have to read it from left to right. Yes? Put it into a stack. You can push it into a stack. Yes? It does do a memory, isn't it? <laughs> what? Well, it does use memory, yes. You will need a bunch of memory. And yes, you are putting it in. Well, but you know, still, 
if you do it this way, you're really only looking at each input symbol once, although I guess you're pulling it back off the stack. But um, so what do you do? You start pushing things on the stack. A, B, B, C, B, B, A. What's a stack? For those of you who don't already know, a stack is a very simple data structure in which it's like a stack of plates. You're allowed to put things on top of other things. And at any given moment, you're only allowed to look at the top of the stack. The only, if, if you want to look at stuff lower down, you can, but only by throwing stuff away from the top. And now, put yourself in the shoes of a very limited type of computer. You will simply be a finite state automaton. At the moment, let's say it's a deterministic finite state automaton, which has access to a stack. OK? Is it clear what I mean by that? I mean, what I mean is that before the transition function of this finite state automaton was just, what's your current state and what's the input symbol? Well, now you can depend on that and what's the top symbol on the stack? And I'll be generous to you. I'm going to have a special symbol which lives at the bottom of the stack so you can even tell when the stack is empty instead of having some sort of uh, site fault. Uh -huh. um, and what are you allowed to do? Well, in a finite state automaton, the output of the transition function was just your new state. Now, in addition, I will allow you to take actions that affect your state. You can push or you can pop things off the stack. And if you push things on the stack, you can choose what symbol you push. I'll call that symbol x or something. Right? So we could write this out in excruciating formalism, but I hope the idea is clear. You're a finite state automaton where your decisions are based not just on your internal state, of which there's only a finite number, but the state of the stack. But just as we do when we write good object-oriented programs, right? We interact with our data structures only through a very specific interface. We don't get to look under the hood of our data structures. We have to be disciplined if we're good object-oriented programmers. And the only question we're allowed to ask our stack data structure is, what's on top? And maybe are you empty or not? And the only thing we're allowed to do, we're not allowed to just change the symbol 10 symbols below, again, we are only allowed to act on it through the simple interface, namely, we can pop a symbol off or we can push a new symbol on. And so we push A and then we push B and then we push B. And during that time, we're in some state one where we know we're still in the first half of the word. Then when we see the C, we switch to state two and what state two does is each time it sees a symbol, it checks to see that it matches the top symbol on the stack. If it doesn't, it's, it halts and rejects and says, this word is terrible, it's not a palindrome. But if it does match, then it pops that thing off the stack and continues. And finally, at the very end, if you ask it, OK, is this word acceptable? It checks to see if the stack is empty. Mm. Could use this method for the uh, equals a and b's too. Absolutely, yes. Um, or for the parentheses language. In fact, for the parentheses language, you could do something even simpler, right? You don't actually need a stack. What do you need for the parentheses language? Counter. Counter. All you really need in that case is a counter. Okay. You only need to keep track of, you know, just keep track of an integer. Um, add one to it whenever you see a left parenthesis. Subtract one whenever you see a right parenthesis. If it ever becomes negative, reject the whole thing. And it starts at zero, and you accept if it ends at zero. And guess what? In between the regular and the context-free languages, there is an intermediate class, which we can define. It. Hardly <laughs> anyone cares about it, but it exists. Namely, the one counter languages, <laughs> which are the things you can recognize if what you are is a finite state of dominant, 
with a single integer counter that you can increment and decrement and check to see if it's zero. Or if you like branch on zero, is how we would say it in machine language, right? Um, okay. Uh, but would one counter be enough for palindromes? No. No, it really seems here that because there, there are A's and B's, you really need to store a word, which is a, to put it differently, position sequence. How many different equivalence classes are there when we get here? If I have read L symbols so far. Yeah, infinitely. Oh, well, as a function of L. L. Well, is that this? Yeah. Two to the L? Two to the L, because there are two to the L different first halves of length L. So that means that if you are a left to right machine, which I know no real machine is, but if you are a left to right machine, you, it needs to be possible for you to get into two to the L different states after reading L symbols if you want to be able to be a palindrome recognizer. Now suppose that you're, you have a, an integer counter and suppose that the only thing you're allowed to do is increment or decrement. Well, in that situation, how many different states can you get into after reading L symbols? Well, feel free to use big O. Okay, yeah, big O to L. Big O, big o of L, right? Because yeah. I mean, what, what is a state? Looking at the whole thing combined, the state of, your mach of, of you, or you and your memory, depending on how you anthropomorphize, right? We have k different states here, and but there's also what's written on the stack. So if your stack has a depth of L, which is the most it can be after L steps, if you're allowed to push one thing at a time, and if you're if the choice of what symbols you can put on your stack, people usually define a little stack alphabet, which might be different from the input alphabet, which are the, the set of symbols you can push on the stack. Well, so the total number of states you can be in after L steps is k times gamma to the L, right? Yeah. Maybe, I guess, a little bit more because the stack could have various depths. So anyway, multiplied by L tops, okay? But if instead of a stack you just have a counter, your state is just your internal state, one of these k states from this finite set, and the value of the counter. And if in each step you're only allowed to increment the counter inst instead of, say, multiply it by 7, if you're just able to add or subtract 1 from it, then after L steps, the largest your counter can be is L. And so the counter takes a value somewhere between <coughs> 0 and L. Mm -hmm. And multiplying all those possibilities by k, you only have kL different states you could be in. But k is a constant, because this is a finite state automaton. So you can only be in order L different states. <coughs> so what I'm trying to say is this. The fact that the palindrome language has two to the L different equivalence classes is a proof not just that this language isn't regular, but also proof that it cannot be recognized one by a one counter machine. One counter machines are infinite state machines, but in a very limited way. And they can only get into order L different states after L steps. Whereas the number of equivalence classes we need here grows faster than that. Is that clear what I said? Mm -hmm. I mean, you simply need to have, you really need to have L bits of information by the time you get here. A one counter machine cannot store L bits of information in L steps. Because increment, you know, if a number of size L, how many bits of information does it have? How many bits does it take to write down a number whose maximum value is L? Log, Log, Log L. L. Yeah. Okay. So a one counter machine can only have about Log L bits. And you need L bits to 
to re because you need to remember every every bit in the first half of length alpha. Mm -hmm. So the game here is that what we're doing is we're saying, okay, well, finite state machines. I mean, they're you know they're cute, but there's really not much they can do. Pretty much every language, every set of strings we care about is not regular. So we need some sort of infinite state machine. Well, what is an what is an infinite state machine? Um, well, I mean, I could just write down some crazy graph with an infinite number of nodes, except it would take me too long to write it down, right? But remember when we wrote down, let's see, remember the language, yet another obviously non-regular language, one where the total number of A's equals the total number of B's. And we wrote down this automaton. Right? So we move to the right whenever we see an A, we move to the left whenever we see a B. We start at zero and begin, we, we want to end at zero in order to accept. Well, this is an infinite state automaton, but it's obviously a very highly structured infinite state yeah. automaton. It's, it's an infinite state machine, but which has a nice finite description. Okay? Well, in the same way, Counter-automata, counter or these things, which are called, they ought to be called stack automata, but unfortunately that name was taken, so they're called push-down automata, or PDAs. Um, these are infinite state machines, but where their transitions from one state to another, even though it's a potentially infinite set, there's a very simple finite description of how those transitions work. So this is a nice, I know, I know this is slightly abstract, but it's a nice point, right? Some infinite graphs are just crazy infinite graphs without any rhyme or reason to them, without any pattern. But some have a very simple periodic structure which can be described. And after all, what is a program? Okay, so your laptop has roughly a billion bits, give or take a couple of factors of 10. More if you count the hard drive, okay? How many states can your laptop be in? Two to the... Two to the billion. Yeah. That's really a fairly large number, right? Two to the billion. So your laptop is a finite state machine with two to the billion states. But the nice, one of the nice things about the way we think about computation in a modern way is we write programs. And a program is, does not know a priori the size of the machine it's running on, right? A program is a kind of idealized object which could run on a larger and larger computer with, with more and more memory. So a program if you, is really a kind of finite description of a machine which is potentially infinite. That's what programs are. And I mean, put yourself in the shoes of somebody in the 1920s who's trying to think about what it means to compute. I mean, I know that everything I'm saying is sort of obvious now, but it wasn't always that way, right? I mean, the fact that we have this very nice software level way of thinking about computation we're no longer like wiring and, and an OR gates together. Well, I mean, at the Intel uh, fab plant, they're wiring and an OR gates together, but that's not how we program computers. Okay. So it's actually very nice that for us, we are free to think in this at this software level. It sort of frees our thinking in a lot of ways. Um, okay, anyway, well, let me, uh, let me give you an example of something that even, oh, okay, so, so, so first of all, <coughs> well, all right, so back from the abstract world, uh, what if I didn't have this marker here, okay? All right, so I still want you to recognize palindromes, but I no longer give you a convenient signpost telling you, you are now in the center of the word, it's time to turn around. So now tell me what kind of machine 
I would like to have to recognize palindromes without this central marker. Undeterministic. Yes, exactly. Using stack. The same thing, again with a stack, but now it's non-deterministic. Because now it can guess that it's in the center. So it can choose to start to, uh, to turn around. And um, then it's a palindrome if there is a computation path, a legal computation path, that ends with an empty stack. Okay. So in general, context-free languages turn out to be exactly the languages that non-deterministic pushdown automata can recognize. There is a subclass called the deterministic context-free languages, uh, which can be recognized by deterministic pushdown automata. It turns out, unlike finite state automata, non-deterministic pushdown automata are actually more powerful than deterministic ones. I'm not going to prove that, but let me give you an example which illustrates the idea. So first of all, using the grammatical definition, I claim that if L1 and L2 are CFLs, then so is L1 union L2. Proof this. There are context-free grammars for generating L1 and another one for generating L2. I claim there is a context-free grammar which generates their union. How do I build it? You do the same thing. Can you need the rules. Can you generate L1 and L2 and both can be epsilon? Uh, oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think someone probably said the right answer, but I'm not sure who or how to piece it back together. So let's have a grammar for L1. It starts with a start symbol S1 and then does stuff. And I have another grammar And a for new L2. start symbol and, and a new rule that S can go to S1, S2. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing we do is decide which of these two seeds to plant and then it grows from there. All right. Okay, well, now I claim that the following two things are, oh, by the way, I also claim, so one thing which is also context-free is their union. I also claim that their concatenation is, how do I do that? Just no sure. or. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Well, certainly, uh, so we already know that this language is context-free. Certainly, the language C star is regular, so this is context-free. And so, by the same argument, is this. Another way to put this is this is strings of a bunch of A's followed by a bunch of B's followed by a bunch of C's such that there are the same number of A's and B's or the same number of B's and C's, or maybe both. This is not exclusive or, yeah. right? So this is context-free, and exercise, actually write down a grammar for it. That should be easy. Now, give me an intuitive reason why this cannot be recognized by a deterministic pushdown automaton when reading from left to right. Don't worry about a proof. Give me the intuition. I, I think because if you only have one stack, you can only keep track of any, just two pairs at the same time. Either you can keep track of the number of A's equals the number of B's, or B's equals C's, but you only have one stack. 
Exactly. So, I mean, you could start by pushing all the A's onto the stack. But now, I'm, now you start seeing B's. You need to either push the B's on and then take them off when you see the C's. Or you need to use them to take off the A's. And intuitively, if you make the wrong choice, you're sunk, right? Because if you should have been canceling the A's with the B's, but instead you add the B's on, and now you're trying to take the C's back off, well, now you get down here, but you're done reading the word. You don't remember how many C's there were. <laughs> if you had two stacks, it would be a snap. But you only have one. Okay. All right. So that's... You know, it's examples like this which actually show that, in, that unlike finite state automata, the DPDAs are actually a proper subclass of the CFLs. I claim they do include the regular languages because we can do a DFA. Right. Yes? Uh, are deterministic pushdown automatas with multiple stacks? Just, just equal to non-deterministic pushdown automators? Is that? Uh, no. <laughs> no. In fact, it turns out that for any k, you can do more with k stacks than you can do with k minus one stacks. If you are reading the word from left to right. Okay. So something we'll prove later, which is kind of charming, is. If you aren't, if you are not limited to reading the word left to right, if I just put it in your memory and now you can move around left to right, with two stacks you can do anything. You can do universal computation with two stacks, which is a very cute fact. So where stacks are concerned, there's this kind of funny boundary between what you can do with just one of them which is context-free languages, and what you can do with, with more than one, at least if you can move left and right. Actually, sorry, if you can move left and right, then what you can do with one stack is already fairly complicated, but it's not everything. You said two stacks? Okay. If you have two stacks and you're allowed to move left and right, I claim that you can do anything that, any computable thing, anything you can do with a program in your favorite programming language, although very slowly. It's a very inefficient computer, but it will eventually get the job done. Um, yeah. So, uh, all right. There's one more thing I want to say, which is just I, I think we need to see some example of something which is outside the context free languages. So, somebody who didn't already know this. If, can someone give me an example, not something really complicated like, you know, good poems or something like that, but, but some simple set of words which you think is not a context-free language? Some nearby relative of things we've already seen. perhaps inspired by this example. So this is the union of two context-free languages. Mm -hmm. It is a non-deterministic context-free language, but not a deterministic one. If we let um, i less than j and less than k, would it work? That would work, but let's make it even simpler. So in other words, a to the n, b to the n, c to the n. Okay. Well, you're yeah. you're stuck for the same reason. Yeah. I mean, only one. You, you build up the a's. Now you cancel them out with the b's. But now you've an empty stack. You don't. You no longer remember how many a's or b's there were. Only that those two things were equal. So now I start feeding you the c's, but you have no way to tell. I mean, another. Uh, th th there are several ways to prove that this is not context-free. One of them is that there's a fancier version of the pumping lemma for context-free languages. 
Um, and so I'll just explain the intuition behind it. So in a regular language, any sufficiently long word can be written like this, and then I can repeat that central section as many times as I want. That's very good. Well, a context-free language, it turns out that anything can be written like this, where I can pump, X, I can repeat x and z as long as I repeat them the same number of times. Uh, well, I should use t for something else. Okay. So why is this? Well, the idea is that in any sufficiently long derivation, there's some path through the tree which repeats the same variable twice. Why is that? So if I have a grammar with variables and production rules, then in any sufficiently deep tree, if I look on a long path, there'll be some variable which appears twice on this path. Why? How did we know in the case of a DFA? How did we prove the pumping lemma for a DFA? We said that in any sufficiently long path, some state appears twice. The rule is you can sign it. Again, the original principle, yeah. I mean, if, if, it's, if the language is context-free, then by definition, there is some grammar with some finite set of variables. How many variables? You tell me. P. Well then, by the pigeonhole principle, if in my parse tree I have any path of length greater than p, some variable has to be repeated twice. Okay? And what that means is that there's some way for v eventually, by, by repeatedly producing, but by repeatedly applying these rules, there's something that v produces to the left and produces to the right, but then in between we have v again. But if we can do this once, we can do it twice. So if these were all legal productions, we could do that again. And we could do this as many times as we want. And the terminal descendants over here are x, and over here are z, and so we can repeat those as many times as we like. Whatever v turns into by itself when it finally turns into terminals is this middle thing, y. Whatever this stuff here and this stuff here turned into is s and t. Okay? So it's the same type of argument. It's again that if this process, it's no longer just a linear process the way a DFA is. It's now a branching tree, but it's still the same argument that if this process goes on long enough, if we focus on some path, actually any sufficiently long path, we'll see a repetition, and then we can apply that over and over again. So I claim that with this fancier pumping lemma for the CFLs, you can show that this language here is not context-free. Okay? And Another way to put the intuition of this is that context-free things, this example of the parentheses is actually a pretty good general example of how context-free languages work. Context-free languages produce things that are partnered somehow. And because they're context-free, because what gets produced gets produced in a tree-like fashion, there are no crossings like this, okay? So what it means is that the connections between symbols can't cross, okay? So for instance, here's another context-free, here's another language which is not context-free. Words that are repeated twice, like ABC, ABC. 
This isn't context-free because the pairs are now crossing pairs. Uh, sorry. They're no longer nested pairs. Explain to me in terms of a stack why you can, why, why is it hard if all you have is a stack to recognize the word ABC, ABC? On the top you will have C and A on the bottom, but you need to go to the bottom. Yes, stacks are last in, first out. Okay, yes. So what you would really like to have is a queue instead of a stack, which is first in, first out. Stuff A, B, C on one end and take them off the other in the same order. And indeed, there is yet another class of languages, which are the things you can read if you have a single queue and you read things left to right and you don't have much more time. Okay. All right. So, you know, this is a kind of nice way to get you thinking about what you need to know, what, what kind of memory you need, what kind of access you need to have to your memory, which is kind of the same thing as what kind of memory do you have, right? What kind of data structure do you need to have in your memory to solve certain types of problems? Um, one more thing. Prove to me that, uh, tell me whether you believe the following. If L1 and L2 are CFLs, context-free languages, I claim that we already showed that their union is a CFL. What about their intersection? Do you believe this? Yeah. For DFAs, this was really easy to prove. What did we say? We said, run them both. Accept if they both accept. And for DFAs, that makes sense. It's just a bigger DFA whose state space is the Cartesian product of the two state spaces. Can we do the same thing for pushdown automata? Yeah, you just two elements. Oh, we can't, can't do that. <laughs> well, what if, I mean, we only have one stack. Do we share it? What if I want to push and you want to pop? What do we do? Okay, so it's easy to take the Cartesian product of two DFAs, it's still a DFA. But our Cartesian product of two PDAs is more like a two-stack machine. Yeah. Okay? All right, well, so it's not obvious that, inter that intersections of context-free languages are context-free, but it could still be true. Ah, but what if I take the intersection here instead of the union? Oh, that'll be non-context-free. Right, the intersection is there's the same number of A's and B's, and there's the same number of B's and C's. And that's this language, which I claim with a little more work inspired by the fancy pumping lemma, where you have two sections that get repeated an equal number of times. I claim you can prove that this is not context-free. And it's in Sipser. It's the same game, right? We have to take, we have to choose two sections of the word and repeat them. In before we showed that this was not regular because we get into trouble whatever we do. We can't repeat just this, we can't repeat just this, we can't repeat that. Well, here we have to choose two sections. We can't repeat just the A's and B's, or just the B's and C's, or just the A's and C's, and if they cross, then we alternate too much if we repeat. Okay? All right. So um, this is all I'm going to say about regular and context-free languages. There's more in Sipser, um, but now it's time to talk about P and NP and all that good stuff. That's what we'll do on Tuesday, which means that you need to read chapter one of my book because that's where it really talks about the definition of P. And um, I'd like you, and, and chapter one, by the way, is on my webpage. I know a couple of you are still waiting for copies of the book. Um, Chapter two, we're only really going to survey. Chapter two is a is a survey of, pol of strategies for polynomial time algorithms. It's more, if, if you're a computer science student, it's actually a little bit more like the 561 course than it is like this course. I will go over it quickly. I mean, I, uh, and, uh, without too much detail. 
It's things like dynamic programming, divide and conquer, <coughs> um, finding shortest paths. So things that illustrate the basic techniques that we have, that we know of so far, to prove that a problem can be solved in polynomial time. So we need to understand why some problems are easy. But, and then when we talk about NP completeness, we'll talk about why some problems are hard. Okay? So, like I said in my email, if you want your homework to be on time, you need to give it physically to me here or by about quarter to five today when I'm leaving. You can squeak it in before five by giving a hard copy to this computer science department and having them stamp it. If your homework is in electronic form, preferably PDF, because I, I don't have Word, for instance, then you can email it to me anytime before midnight. Okay? And otherwise, if we haven't already talked about an extension, I charge 20% per day. So, get it in. <coughs> Oh, yes, yes, I forgot. Yes. yes. Prove that it is not always true that the complement of a context-free language is context-free. 